Oh, okay. Uh, Sharon Olds, um, most recently author of the Pulitzer Prize winning poetry collection Stag's Leap, is one of the most revered uh, poets in America today. Thank you for being with us. Thank Sharon. you for having me, Chauncey. I'm happy to be here. In, 19, uh, in 1993, at the Key West Literary Seminar on Elizabeth Bishop, the poets were joking uh, that only poets read poetry. Now, however, poetry seems to be in an explosion of, of popularity and renewed relevance and uh, maybe even a golden age. Uh, do you agree with that? Oh, I like to hear that golden age. I like that. Well, there's so many different poetries and each kind of poetry seems alive and well. So there's um, hip hop and then there's sort of popular literary and then, you know, literary, you know, in intellectual. There's just so many kinds. And we're in trouble as a, as a species and as a people. And poetry is good for trouble. So I would hope that that resource for us of sort of singing with uh, spoken word music, you know, without the melody and harmony, but that this singing of our condition uh, as people is going to thrive as we're you know, coming into harder and harder times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, speaking of melody and music, I've always thought of your poetry as being uh, musical, particularly Thank musical, you. and uh, one of your most appealing things. Um, Thank but you. So, so much of modern poetry, especially academic poetry, seems to be completely lacking in music. Uh, you think that that may be why poetry seemed to be falling out of fashion for a while? Well, I hadn't thought of that. What I find in my students at NYU is that by the time two weeks have gone by, we could hear someone's poem without knowing whose poem it was, and we would know whose poem it was, partly by its music. Um, uh, one of our poets in the class, in one of the classes, is from China. So of course her music is very distinctive, but, but there's there's someone from a mountain in North Carolina, a 5,000 foot mountain, a 400 people village, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and his accent is so distinctive. Um, and his also his rhythms of his poems too. So I'm not qu quite answering what you're asking, but I think I'm saying that I love it when someone's music of thought and music of accent are audible and they're they have their own voice in their work. So I think I'm seeing a lot of that. And that's kind of what I'm focusing on, um, is, is the diversity of the young people's voices. Where does the music in your voice come from? Well, it comes from being against the church hymn music I grew up with in a church that emphasized punishment and suffering much more than joy and hope. So the hymns, which in that church I remember as very slowly sung, mm. until if you're a kid you just are going to die of boredom, <laughs> except that you know that this is God's place and that God is going to probably send you to hell. And therefore very interesting um, themes, but in very dirge-like so it's mine, I think, is anti-slow sung, four beat lines, four line quatrains, church hymn style. And hopefully it would have some of the life of the rock and roll that I was dancing to, you know, when first when I was 14, the kind of uh, jazz or rock cut, what used to be called cut and thrust rhythm. So I, that's probably there in, how my lines move around. So I want it to feel alive, ordinary, and the many, many, many poems I write that no one ever sees just don't have a musical life. When, uh, when you give readings around the country, um, is it mostly uh, previous poetry lo lovers who come, or are you finding new readers in your audiences? I find that a lot of people s will say to me afterwards, this is my first poetry reading. And because they're talking to me, the ones who hate, hated it probably aren't talking to me, but they're, but they're saying, I liked it and I didn't think it was like this. When I thought of what a poetry reading would be, I thought I wouldn't understand it. 
but I like your stuff. So yes, I've had that wonderful experience. Stag's Leap uh, partially tells the story of a, of a failing marriage. Uh, do you find that readers are surprised to discover that poetry has the power to engage contemporary life on, you know, on the basic human level as opposed to being um, airy or academic? I think by now, um, as opposed to 40 years ago, the fact that my poems are personal and they're family poems is something people are kind of used to now. In the beginning, I would s submit poems to magazines and get them back incredibly fast, sometimes with very angry comments. If you want to do a women's diary of child rearing experience, may we suggest the Ladies Home Journal. You know, really, they were, some were insulted by this kind of material. I think by now, it's more accepted that poems can be about personal experience, political, national, local, and then the places where the two, like in gender and class, where personal and political are like both present, I think we're in, in more accepting times now than some years ago. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. <coughs> what is it like to be on this end of your career? You've been a major, <laughs> you've been a major literary force for a long time, 30 years, uh, <laughs> and yet, and yet, uh, you're as uh, you're as active, and the fire still burns. I mean, you just won the Pulitzer Prize for <sighs> a major work of poetry. How, what keeps you going? What keeps you operating at that level um, at this point? My students help me very much um, because they're the young new writers, and so I see what people are doing now. And um, also, um, you, nobody feels like a major literary figure. I think that if you're a writer, the poem that you, I used to be able to cross all of this stuff, the poem that you are longing to be a good poem is the one you're going to write tomorrow. And so, I think, I don't know, partly I like writing poems. It's not a duty at all, it's, it's a pleasure, and I write a lot. And most of it's not good, so no one ever sees it. And if I'm writing, I'm alone, and I know no one will ever see what I'm writing. Unless later I decide to type it up. I write longhand. Type it up, send it out, get it back, send it out again, maybe eventually in a book. So I'm living more in, the, in life. I'm living in life. And so poems that have to do with my children or with my partner, or with his uh, place in New Hampshire where I've been learning so much more about nature. Um, I'm interested in, in life, and um, I'm very grateful to still be in, you know, good enough health to be writing. And also, I think that some of us get less neurotic as we get older. Maybe if we start out really neurotic, <laughs> as I did, then there's plenty of room for improvement. So I don't give myself as hard a time in my life as I did even 10 years ago. And so that makes you a little happier. And then with the joy of being able to write, the gift of education that I was given, um, college and then graduate school also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've been lucky. Okay. We're near the end. Uh, can you name three poets that you read for pleasure? I can name four okay. because I've asked myself this question several times about the poets who are or were about a generation older than I am. Um, Muriel Rukeyser, mm -hmm. uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, mm -hmm. uh, Stanley Kunitz, and Ruth Stone. Those are, I think of them as my four, you know, my four um, sort of parents in mm -hmm. poetry. And then all of us have those grandparents of like Emily Dickinson, County Cullen, Walt Whitman. We've got a lot of, we've got a lot of anse good ancestors in this country yeah. in poetry. Sharon Olds, the new book is Stag's Leap. Thank you so much for being with us. Today. Thank you, thank you, my pleasure.